Oh, well, we had a special session, don't we? Yeah, we had a special that's session. Exact session we shouldn't have to. Well, that was supposed to be after the session. I know, but Rourke, yeah. did you make a decision on the exact session? Uh, I believe we're not going to have one. Okay. Okay. We'll have it? Well, we, no, we won't. Okay, work session of Goodyear City Council, Monday, uh, 25 August 2008. All of our council members of council are in attendance except for our council member Souza. He's uh, at the hospital on a checkup. He will be here for the meeting. So, uh, it's a little a late appointment. All items are for discussion only. No action can or will be taken. Uh, we have uh, two items on our agenda. One is the uh, Hidden Valley Transportation Framework Study, and uh, then we have an update on the status of the business points of the PPP for uh, Phase One City Hall and infrastructure. Oh, oh. yes, made it. He's here. So, all seven of us are here, and uh, we'll start the first item. Do you want to see? Yeah, I'm just. Not, I'm not going to participate in this one, given my. I, I don't think we've got a relationship with you currently, but given the fact that I'm involved in the framework studies on a statewide basis, I'm not going to participate in the work session on this one. So I'll be in the back. He just wants eating to eating all the pizza. You just, just want to get out of it and eat all the pizza. Come on. <laughs> all right. Well, Council Member and uh, Vice Mayor Antonek has recused himself, and uh, I would say uh, Bob Hazlitt is not only Mag, but he is a resident of the city of Goodyear. So. Glad to have Great. you. Okay, Mario. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council, and welcome back. I'd just like to introduce Bob Hazlett, his uh, project manager with the Maricopa Association of Governments. And MAG is the lead agency on the Transportation Framework Study. So Bob is here tonight with an update. Okay. Bob? Thanks. Mayor Cavanaugh, members of the Goodyear City Council, it is always a pleasure to be able to present to uh, the Council, and especially tonight, to talk about the Interstates 8 and 10 Hidden Valley Transportation Framework Study. This is a project that's been underway for the better part of a year, and uh, we're right now getting to the point where we're about ready to start making some, uh, some recommendations. And so uh, as I uh, present to Council tonight, I want to uh, bring you up to date to where the project stands, what we think our recommendations are going to be, and then um, after I'm done, talk a little bit about this Arizona Parkway uh, concept. I spoke with staff earlier, and they had suggested that maybe uh, Council needs a, a briefing on that, and then conclude it and uh, open it up for some questions. So to get going here. Um, again, we're doing this as part of frameworks. Uh, frameworks are not new to Goodyear, obviously, but uh, uh, we are, you know, doing in the midst of doing frameworks all around the state. Uh, we being uh, the Arizona Department of Transportation and the Arizona Cog and MPO Association, of which Mag is a part of. Uh, this particular framework study is uh, is uh, again looking to the south, uh, but you know why do we need them and why are we working with them? And the biggest part of it is is to try and get out in front of growth. I know the council has had a lot of articles seen in the paper about why aren't we seeing this growth coming, why aren't we doing something about it. And so that's what these frameworks are about by just trying to understand a number of factors that you see on your screen before you. Now this framework study is not anything really new in a lot of respects. The first, very first framework study that was done was done way back in 1960 and it laid out, as you see up here on, your, uh, on the map right here, the uh, major street and highway plan or the regional freeway system uh, that uh, was recently just completed. You can look at this uh, map that dates back to 1960 and you see the semblance of the uh, freeway corridors uh, I identified there in red and how they were able to, uh, to move throughout the entire valley. So framework planning is really nothing new. Uh, what we're trying to do is, is try and get to that next ring of growth that's, uh, that's, uh, that's scheduled to happen over the next 50 to 70 years uh, here in the valley. Now our study sequence that we, uh, we work to, it all works towards that center box that you see right there, quarters of determina or quarter determination, where we're taking things like land use projections, alternatives analysis, an environmental scan, all the stakeholder information we can get, travel demand models, and all the other known actions to try and identify where these corridors should be. And a lot of these are corridors of the future uh, that are identified in the framework. And then ultimately, we come out of that with an actual recommendation. Now, the very first fr 
framework study of the modern era, I guess if you want to call it that, was the one that was done out here, Interstates 10, Hacienda Valley Roadway Framework Study. That was just accepted by MAG Regional Council in February of 2008, and these are all the things that MAG Regional Council went for accepting it, including identified traffic interchange locations on 10, on I-10, uh, out in the Hacienda Valley, the uh, two-mile spacing for new freeways in the framework areas, and then this new Arizona Parkway functional classification that we'll talk about. Everything was accepted as quarters of the future, and all the recommendations were, um, were transmitted on to the affected jurisdictions for incorporation into their general plans. This affected mostly Buckeye, the Hasayampa uh, Roadway Framework Study mostly affected Buckeye, and they just recently uh, incorporated it pretty much verbatim into their general plan that the voters approved at a margin of about 85% here in the last election. Now the study that you see, and I'm sorry that this is a very small map, but uh, again, Instead of just producing a comb-bound report, what we've done is, is we've gone ahead and put together what we call an executive summary poster. And this is the front page of the poster, and this is the back page of the poster. And uh, right now, this is being printed, and as soon as it is printed, the city of Goodyear will, of course, get a number of copies of these because Goodyear was a funding partner on the Hacienda study. But you can kind of see from this map here the uh, resemblance of uh, freeways, parkways, and the arterial network, trying to work with about 100 master plan communities communities to accommodate a population of almost two and a half million people uh, by the time this area is built out. Now if we move our attention down south to the Hidden Valley area, uh, this is really south of Hacienda and the area that we started looking at is, as you can see depicted here, bounded by the Gila River on the north, Interstate 10 on the east over in Pinal County, uh, the Tahana Autumn and the Barry Goldwater Range on the south, and then 459th Avenue here in Maricopa uh, County on the west. Uh, roughly about 3,200 square miles is what this uh, framework study is looking at. And you can see there are population employment estimates of almost 2.5 million people uh, by the time it's built out and roughly about a million one in employment. This covers a significant part of Goodyear, as you can see right there towards the center. In fact, Goodyear, uh, the area that's, uh, that's been annexed now all the way down to Mobile, that entire area is part of this Hidden Valley uh, framework area that we have been looking at. Uh, to date, what we've done on this project, we've had over 90 meetings with different stakeholders. Uh, we've been coordinating with other framework studies that have been going on. As uh, Vice Mayor Antoniak had talked about, the uh, framework studies are being done around the state, and there's one that's being done right next door called the Central Arizona Framework Study, which looks in the eastern Pinal County. Uh, we've had a preliminary framework that's been developed in about 15 months, and we anticipate recommendation of this in, sometime in October, and we're moving towards MAG Regional Council acceptance in March of 2009. And at the same time, too, since this crosses over, this is uh, not just a MAG area, but it crosses over into the Central Arizona Association of Governments in Pinal County, where well, we're going to be working with them to get concurrence on them for their acceptance of the study at the same time. And uh, they have been an integral part of the, uh, of the workings of this project. Every one of our framework studies uh, goes through what we call an environmental scan. Uh, this is something that's way different than what was done back in 1958 and 59. And what we do is, is we try to take a look at a number of different, oops, trying to see what happened here. Went fast. Okay. What we're trying to do is we try to, try to take a look at over 35 different environmental factors and try to map those out so that when we're starting to lay out these corridors, we are trying not to um, go over anything that's of a known environmental uh, avoid, if you will, uh, looking at things like cultural resources, air quality considerations, aviation slopes, we're working all the way down to wildlife quarters, the latter of which we've been working on with uh, the uh, Bureau of Land Management and Arizona Game and Fish to help uh, map those out and to help make certain that the quarters we're working with uh, try to avoid those as best as possible. Um, we've been working through um, about five different alternatives, and I believe in the packet that you've received, you see the, the main pri primary uh, alternatives. And what I'm going to present to you today to kind of keep, keep this going is I'm going to kind of center upon what, our, what we think our recommendation is going to be, but we use these evaluation criteria that are based on our study goals of safety, mobility, access to land uses, making certain that we're in agreement with the planning consistency across the entire Hidden Valley area, which means coordinating with Gila Bend, Buckeye, Goodyear, Maricopa, and Casa Grande, as well as Pinal and Maricopa counties, um, trying to minimize through that environmental scan the environmental impacts that we have, uh, looking at trying to minimize construction wherever we can, the costs that are associated with them, and also trying to identify which one has the best, um, 
uh, uh, community support, and we've had a number of public meetings as well as meetings with uh, a lot of stakeholders in the area to get their, uh, their take on this. Well, the framework that we're starting to settle upon is what you see on this map before you. Um, at, when you take a look at, the, at this uh, entire study area, there are really not too many areas where we can really build uh, high-capacity transportation corridors. Uh, there are a lot of things that we have to avoid, and the biggest one that we're working on avoiding more than anything else is the Gila River Indian community. Uh, when we started off this project and we met with representatives from Pinal County, including the mayor of Maricopa and the mayor of Casa Grande, as well as the Pinal County supervisor, um, the biggest question was, well, how can we use this Hidden Valley Framework Study to help uh, for traffic from Maricopa getting across the Gila River Indian community up in the Phoenix area? And as we started to work through this, it became very much apparent to us that it's not going to be possible really to make any new recommendations for any new corridors across the Gila River Indian community. They're a sovereign nation. They have rights to their lands. They have um, certain uh, things that they want to do with their lands. And so to respect that, what became very apparent to us was is we had to try and create some kind of a ring road system around the Gila River Indian community uh, to be able to help channel that traffic into the Phoenix metropolitan area. And the biggest part of this is really, as you can see over here, and I'll see if this uh, cursor works right here. There we go. Move on down. The biggest part of this is working on a quarter, uh, freeway quarter facility that stretches its way, its, its way through uh, Mobile area and then meets uh, the Loop 303 extension that's been uh, discussed now uh, through the Australia Mountain Ranch area. But that would be one of the primary ways for folks from Maricopa to be able to get back up into the metropolitan area and vice versa. But what we also found, too, was is that when we start to extend some of the other freeway facilities that we had in the Haciampa Valley and we start to mash things up, we start to see this corridor uh, that starts to develop that's called the Haciampa Valley uh, Freeway Corridor that pretty much stretches all the way from Coolidge all the way through Casa Grande, Maricopa, up here into Goodyear, and then up into the Haciampa Valley itself, pretty much performing that next loop, if you will, uh, or bypass around the uh, Phoenix metropolitan area, but also providing much needed access to all the uh, immediate development that's been identified in the area. As part of our, our study, we've also taken a very hard look at transit and trying to figure out what to do with transit. And the preliminary framework that we're looking at right now is a network of rail as well as high occupancy vehicle lanes for bus rapid transit and also uh, and enhanced commuter corridors uh, throughout the entire Hidden Valley area. Uh, you can kind of see there along that Hidden Valley or that Haciampa Freeway uh, there that goes runs east-west through uh, Pinal County and then as it stretches up here into Goodyear, seeing that as being kind of a rail loop, um, building the rail possibly alongside the freeway uh, to be able to provide access for folks uh, from the Hidden Valley area up to the Phoenix metropolitan area and vice versa. Uh, you can also see, too, the um, additions of HOV lanes, and some of those lanes have already been discussed with Gila River Indian community along State Roads 347 and Interstate 10. And so what we've done there is just gone ahead and tried to capitalize upon that and added that to, uh, to the recommendations. <coughs> Now, as we start to do our assessment, and we've done a fair amount of assessment, I will share you with just some of the brief uh, highlights of that. What we've done is that we've taken this framework and we've kind of taken it back and looked and said, okay, does this make sense for this particular area? And what we do is, is we compare that in what we call lane miles per thousand persons. And so when you take a look at the Hidden Valley area, roughly about two and a half million in population, you see how it stacks up in terms of freeway uh, lane miles per thousand, as well as parkways and major arterials per thousand. And then you look at that compared to uh, present day Phoenix, it stacks up uh, pretty favorably. And we feel very good about the, the recommendation that we have there, that we are uh, stacking and getting a, a network that, that matches uh, what we have in the valley today. We compare that out to other cities uh, throughout the United States, looking at Chicago, Dallas, and um, Houston, and Atlanta, and you start to see how uh, the ha Hidden Valley and the Haciampa Valley kind of stack up compared to those, and they all uh, compare very favorably to that. Now, as we started doing a lot of our recommendations in the Haciampa Valley in particular, and as we started looking at things here into the Hidden Valley, uh, we've identified another type of roadway that, uh, that seems to make a lot of sense in terms of being able to carry traffic volumes, but at the same time, too, uh, be able to provide private property access. And that is something that we've termed the Arizona Parkway. We looked at different types of construction around the country, and a lot of us uh, were familiar with some of the stuff that's been done in Michigan over the last 40 years, and they call it the Boulevard Arterial. 
but you can kind of see what it looks like. It's a, a fairly wide roadway, um, can uh, fit in anywhere from about 180 to about 240 feet of right-of-way, um, has a very wide median, uh, and what that does is, is that it pro prohibits left turns at intersections in what we call the indirect left turn. Um, now, a lot of folks have talked to me and said, well, wait a second, you're going to make people go through an intersection, you around, and then make a left turn. That's faster. Um, believe it or not, we've done enough model simulations to find out that it is a lot faster to do something like this. And in a lot of respects, if you take a look at it, it's almost like an elongated roundabout, if you will, uh, for this particular area. Uh, what we found is, is that the capacity of the facility when you do this, you go down to what we call just two-phase traffic signals. You get rid of all the left turn arrows and you just have a, rather, a green ball or a red ball and traffic just proceeds through and they bunch up very well as a re result of this. But what we also found out that's very important to us is, is just how well the um, safety uh, value is of these particular facilities. Just to give you a, a little bit of a statistic here, here in Maricopa County on our arterial network, our crash rate is roughly about 2.8 crashes for about every million miles of uh, vehicles traveled here in Maricopa County. Oakland County, Michigan, which the majority of their facilities are built this way, is one of the collar counties around Detroit, population about 1.1 million. Their crash rate is 0.43, or roughly about 20% of what ours is. And so when you start to take a look at a facility that improves capacity and also improves safety, it just makes a ton of sense to start recommending these facilities here in our framework study, study process. Uh, these facilities have, been, have gone on for more, and this is what they look like in, the, um, in an aerial position. A lot of folks have said, well, wait a second, they become great walls of China, and I pulled this up and I said, I don't think so. Uh, you can see how, they, uh, how uh, businesses like to locate on them. Again, these are carrying a lot of traffic, but at the same time, too, they're a lot safer, and they also provide for a lot of pedestrian access going back and forth across uh, this, this particular facility. So uh, to conclude, um, uh, this is my warranty slide that I always like to point out, is that what we've been doing is, is this is just a framework that the locations are subject to change. You remember I talked about the framework that was done back in 1960 that identified the original regional freeway system. If you look at the north end of the perimeter of the, uh, of the 101, the Hour Free and the Pima freeways, back in 1960 they recommend that it goes down Bell Road. Today it goes down Beardsley Road because all these additional studies have been done and that's where the facility ended up happening. So again, it's just a framework. Things cannot, can, can def, definitely move around. And the most important thing down at the bottom here is that the actions are not currently funded at all. Uh, but at the same time, we've got to get something out there. We've got to at least start talking about it. Uh, I will uh, finish up my presentation by showing you when you put both Hacienda and Hidden Valleys together, you start to see the semblance of this network that's starting to, to form. Uh, this uh, Hacienda Freeway, I, I can't get your cursor to work here, I don't have a pointer, but you can kind of see how it is starting to form its loop around uh, the outer part of the uh, metro area. You see Loop 303 and its prominence in this um, in this area, and then you see the other freeway quarters that have been talked about and how we're planning now, when you put Hidden Valley and Hacienda Valley together, it's a network uh, that would accommodate about five and a half million people uh, in a build-out type situation. So Mr. Mayor, that concludes my presentation, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to present. I also have to say a big round of thanks to Luke Albert, Mario Sadamondo, and Cato Esquivel for all their assistance that they've given. Uh, your staff has been absolutely tremendous and uh, has been uh, absolutely awesome to work with on this particular project. Hey, thank you. Questions or comments from over here? No, I've, I've gone to one of the... Um meetings that you've had, and uh, I think it was when we were discussing different options, right. A, B, or C. Um, you hit a point upon my area of wanting to see the railways, and so I'm glad to see that's, that's really being thought ahead. Thank you. Thank you. How certain are we with the 303 corridor at the present time? Uh, could you, uh, in terms of what? <laughs> Oh, the, the actual location? Yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman uh, Sousa, um, the actual location of it and everything, um, we've identified, especially what has been identified in the Goodyear Comprehensive Plan, that that's what was in the Goodyear Comprehensive Plan is what you see on the, uh, the mapping right now. Um, in terms of where that corridor actually lands, that's still going to be subject to whatever the Arizona Department of Transportation does in their actual corridor alignment studies. But they have to look at your comprehensive plan and use that as a go-by to be able to say that, you know, this is where the city 
or the local residents prefer for it to be and so they'll go back to that and work with that as kind of a baseline but they will have to look at all the quarters that are possible in the area and figure out which one makes most sense in terms of minimal impacts but is also the most economical that we don't hit an area where it's going to cost too much to build and stuff like that and so that study uh, it's called a quarter location study um, and this is going to be for the loop 303 extension from uh, State Road 801 or the I-10 reliever all the way down to the Hacienda freeway that study is about ready to get kicked off here at ADOT and so hopefully we'll have some better definition on that quarter here shortly okay thank you me first. Um, you know, not having driven on any of the roads that prevent left turn, have you had an opportunity to do that? And did you find it confusing to, for new folks that are coming into the area that don't know the system? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilwoman Holland, uh, yes, I have driven on these roadways. Um, in fact, I had a client in the Taubman companies back when I was in private practice about 20 years ago. And Talman is the same people that own Arizona Mills Mall, and they also own Sotheby's Auction House, and so they're very well, and they're located on the north side of Detroit. And um, this was back in pre-TSA days, but I was running late for a flight. I had a meeting at their offices, and all this time I was always taking the interstates, the freeways, to get from their office down to uh, Detroit Metro Airport, and they said, no, go down Telegraph Road. And I said, you're nuts. That's going down a roadway with about 80 signals. So they said, trust us. And believe it or not, I was able to drive down it. I hit through 80 signals I, uh, that very first time. I think I only got stopped three times the entire time, going through 80 different signals. So it was like I, I made 77 signals, and two of those were interrupts that were created by emergency vehicles. And so, you know, I'm a traffic engineer, and I kind of already can see the patterns and stuff like that, and so I can see that happening. But I, I would give you these two points. This construction has been built on International Drive over in Orlando, right next to Disney World. That is a very well-traveled roadway that is a lot of foreign tourists, so to speak, to, Arizona, to Florida, you know, folks from all over the United States as well as throughout the world. And so they have seen similar crash rates. They've been awfully low. Um, the biggest part of it is you just got to make certain you sign up well. Uh, one thing I might also add, too, is, is that in Michigan, um, in Detroit, borders Canada, and when you come out of the tunnel from in, coming from Canada, you go immediately onto one of these types of facilities. You can't make a left out of the tunnel. You have to make a U around. And the Canadians have been doing it for a long time, and they don't seem to have any issues with it. So, again, it's, it's a matter of signing more than anything else. Something I might also add, too, is, is that the Maricopa County Department of Transportation has gone ahead and studied this even further to where they have now design, draft design guidelines on these particular projects. And they've gone through and done a very rigorous independent analysis and have put all this uh, uh, together. And the city now, staff now has those guidelines that they can work with them if, uh, if the city so chooses to do. Well, that sounds good. I, I'm glad that you, you guys have done all this. Uh, the reason I was asking is because uh, there have been places before, and I think all of us that have come from other, other towns, and you're driving along and you know right where you want to go, and you can see it, but you cannot figure out <laughs> how to get over there. That's why I was asking that question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bob, uh, nice presentation. Appreciate the clarity of everything. And I want to ask, though, on this Asiampa uh, freeway, is this planned to be a part of the Canmax uh, highway? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman Cavalier, yes, uh, in a lot of respects, it, you could say that it would probably be become Canamex. Because Canamex is not, it's been defined down Vulture Mine Road corridor, and it's been identified to go down State Road 85 and Interstate 8. Um, and there's a good chance that, you know, now that we have this potential freeway alternative, that it could, it could uh, be part of that Canamex corridor. However, that Canamex corridor def definition might be the Hacienda freeway down to State Road 85 and then 85 down to 8 and then down 10, uh, whereas the rest of it, you know, would be, be, be left as a, a local regional facility. But it does give that definition or better definition, of course, to Canamex. And it's also been uh, posed, too, that that Hacienda freeway, you can see on the map there that I've got it going up to Wickenburg as part of the Wick ultimate Wickenburg bypass. There's been a lot of discussion about there being a uh, four-lane or interstate 
freeway type route between Phoenix and Las Vegas. We're the two fastest growing metropolitan areas in the nation, yet we do not have a freeway between us. We have a two-lane road. Um, something doesn't make sense there. And, um, and so as we start to take a look at that, the question has always been, well, how do you bring that kind of a freeway into the, into the Phoenix area? And so I think we've identified that using, using Hacienda where you have these freeways that kind of feed into it. So you don't have just one way to get to the Hacienda freeway. You actually have four. And then the other thing, the <clears throat> rail, this being a probably commuter rail that we're talking about here, and uh, how far out, if it's possible, how far out do you see that happening? And uh, what, what's ADOT? Of course, ADOT probably doesn't have a part in that. I don't know what ADOT's part is in that. Well, well Mr. Mayor, Councilman uh, Cavalier, um, the time initiative that uh, that was right. on off the ballot <laughs> we're not certain about where it is exactly at right now uh, but the uh, on the time initiative the governor had in um, in the proposal of course the commuter rail line between um, well high-speed rail line between Tucson and Phoenix as well as trying to give us the initial semblance if you will of a core of a commuter rail plan for the valley um, MAG has already done its commuter rail strategic plan, trying to figure out, you know, okay, if we're going to go with commuter rail, where are the corridors, where should they be, and then which should be the first ones. And, and that, count, that study is already done and has been accepted by MAG Regional Council, and now we're moving to that next phase of trying to figure out, okay, how do you actually make this happen? How do you actually make it work? Um, and, and so we've been trying to work through that, that whole thing. I, I would have to say that I think commuter rail is definitely in our future. The timing is 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 a little cloudy right now, just because there are a lot of variables that are involved. Whether or not uh, it, 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 it we work with the Union Pacific Railroad uh, in their corridor, or we go down a new corridor, all those types of questions still have to be asked. It's still many years away, but nonetheless, it is something that is, I think, is on our is on in our future. It's just a matter of of working through all the things that we have to do, and I, obviously with four dollar gas right now. We would like to work faster, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things and a lot of things that work there that keep us from moving as quickly as we can on that. Particular is that thing. is that uh, plan available to us? Yes, it is, sir. Um, and uh, and if you'd like, I'll make certain that uh, that council has uh, has that information. I'll work through Mario to make certain that you have that, a copy of that uh, strategic the commuter rail strategic plan. Thank you very much, Council Member Osborne. One last question: As soon as you mentioned um, Orlando. Yes. I realized that last summer we drove from Goodyear to Orlando, and we were on that that parkway, and I, I just dawned on me. Um, but what, looking at this map that you currently are showing, what would be the Arizona Parkway, or what would be the thought of area for that? Well, the the uh, the, uh, the quarters that you see identified in green are the ones that we're starting to see as being Arizona Parkway quarters. Um, and a lot of those are mainly up in the Hacienda Valley area. Uh, we have a couple that stretch down um, the Sonoran Valley Parkway that connects Mobile and uh, comes up through Jackrabbit Trail was one that's been identified. Um, and then there's another one called Hidden Waters Parkway that's kind of parallel State Road 85 uh, connecting Gila Bend up to um, the Hacienda Valley. And then there's a number of them identified over there in Pinal County. But it's mainly the ones that have been identified in green. And we recognize that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of planning that's been underway. Uh, we've done our best to coordinate as much as we possibly can. But we're trying to work with the cities and as well as with Maricopa County and Pinal County to make certain that we can, uh, we can you know, kind of, kind of hone in on those facilities. Okay, just a couple of questions, Bob. I, sure. I've been told by uh, your boss, in fact, that the, uh, the four remaining framework studies were on hold pending the time, sub the, uh, time, issue. time, yeah. Issue, yeah. time ballot issue. Mr. And Mayor, are you saying that they're underway? Well, Mr. Mayor, they are. Um, right now they're on hold from, from any kind of public presentation or any type of you know working with the stakeholders right now the the consultant is continuing to work on those particular projects and trying to you know keep them as current as possible so that once November comes and we have a, a definite idea of what happens with the um, with the ballot initiative then they can move forward with their finishing up the planning so they're kind of on idle if you will on these parkways uh, they're about half the right away of a freeway aren't they or Give or take a couple hundred feet, yes. <laughs> about 200 feet, yes. So the parkway is, I mean, the freeway is about 300, three to five. 350 to 400 is what ADOT is like. Depends on like what to mountain it goes through, it says. Right? <laughs> that, that's <Really>? true. <laughs> okay. Can, 
are we looking at, first off, in the West Valley, we have several major landowners willing to donate land. Mm -hmm. Is that reality mentioned at all in the framework studies? Yes, sir, it is. Um, we, we talk about, um, if you, if going through the Haciampa, we talk about, uh, about how the development community has been kind of coalescing behind all of this. Um, what's been quite interesting is, is that when we present to them the idea of the parkways, at first there was a little bit of resistance because they said, oh, you're going from 130 feet or 140 feet to 200 feet. That's a lot of right of way. But then we started showing them the benefits from safety as well as from capacity. And for a lot of those that are retail developers, we say, would you rather have 90,000 cars in front of your store or would you rather have 60,000? And they say, we'll take the 90. And so we've been working with them and trying to identify that. There is a, a strong sense, though, though, that you know a lot of these parkways are, are of a regional nature, and so we need to kind of uh, address those a little bit better here in the future as to how you know what the region's uh, responsibilities may be on those particular uh, uh, facilities. Like, granted, these are all framework studies. We're all you know kind of looking at them in the big abstract now, and uh, we have the RTP that's underway. We want to get that constructed. That's the primary goal of MAG right now. But again, as you get post RTP, we get past 2025, we start to take a look at that. We start to try to figure out, you know, how, how, how can the region play uh, a role with these particular parkways? Well, why are we trying to reserve these uh, donated land rights away and plan for the near term to use them for parkways, but have the right of way donated for the long term freeway so we can start moving people sooner rather than later? That, that is something that is certainly being looked at um, in a lot of other areas. Placed in front of decision makers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if parkways make sense, mm -hmm. and I've told this to your two bosses, and they didn't pay a bit of attention, and that is why isn't the South Mountain an interim parkway? Why aren't we moving people around Phoenix on an interim parkway? Which the. The GRIC probably wouldn't agree, but the people in that that committee would agree. Mr. Mayor, I think your 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 idea has has gotten a lot of traction. A lot of trash. Traction. 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 <laughs> I thought the former, so I, we're moving in the right direction. Forgive me, sir. I, I I can't enunciate right now, but yes, traction. It okay. has it has gotten some traction. Right. Mayor, can I add to that? Yes. Uh, what? What is the timeline for the 202, 202 the uh, South Mountain Freeway? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman Cavalier, right now the uh, South Mountain EIS is underway. Uh, they are looking for a record of decision on it in 2010, uh, which would then launch it into design. Um, and my, my understanding is, is that right now ADOT's looking at uh, provided we have a favorable record of decision, there aren't any lawsuits, et cetera, that, um, that we might be underway with some kind of uh, construction on South Mountain by 2014. Okay. And the 801 will follow after that, I would say. That, uh, yes, sir, that's, uh, that's, the mean, that's, way the, that's the way the regional transportation plan uh, is, is, is set up, that the 202, because right now if you just build the 801, where does it dump? Yeah. Sure. I mean, we have to have the two or two before we get yeah. touching the yeah. I'm sure this. Start construction of a, on a road that was approved in 1985. 85. And they're going to start construction yeah. in 2014. Probably not, but that's, that's mm -hmm. the plan. It's well, and it, I mean. 30 years. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. That's. Well, it's not your fault, Bob. <laughs> I appreciate that, sir. Whatever. He's, he's a good year citizen. He's a good year citizen. <laughs> yeah. I need it. Well, only in Arizona. He's a voter. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thanks, Bob. Open the door. We'll let the others in here. Okay, uh, again, we have seven members of council. Uh, Vice Mayor is uh, back, in the, back in the council. Uh, we're now moving to the second item on our work session.
and that is to get an update from the staff regarding the status and key business points of the public-private partnership agreement related to Phase 1 City Hall and related infrastructure as well as the library. Brand Key. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Mayor, members of the council. I think I caught Bob's disease <laughs> enunciation. Um, but it's a pleasure to be back in front of you today and welcome back from vacation. Uh, tonight we're going to spend about 55 minutes and going through an update for you. We will have the uh, developer, proposed development team in front of you as well. We want to keep this interactive. Uh, you'll find that staff's comments are going to be um, fairly brief to allow some interaction with the development team. So, Mr. Mayor, with that, tonight we'll do quick, very quick uh, project history. Jim Nichols will jump up and do that. We'll talk about the overview of the two agreements that we'll be uh, bringing back before you. And tonight we can't go into a lot of the detail on the agreements, just um, to let you know that in advance, because we are still in the negotiation stage, so therefore limited in what we can say, but we do want to give you that overview. Larry will talk about the project budget and financing plan that's changed some, um, not amounts, but just approach um, as we go forward. And then we'll get to the phase one project. Mr. Rob Lankford uh, with Lankford & Associates, he will uh, be uh, presenting that along with his team. Finally, next steps. So that's what we're looking at doing tonight. With that, I'm going to call up Jim Nichols for the quick opening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, first off, as Brian said, I'll be giving you a very quick history on uh, what brought us to this point in the city center project. To start with, this is a uh, overview of, uh, of where city center is located. I'm sure you're all familiar, but just in the way of history, it is the northwest 40 acres that the city owns at the intersection of uh, Yuma, and Yuma and Australia Parkway. Here's a close-up of the project site, and one thing I did want to mention in particular is that uh, one of the issues associated with the site has been that it is, a, it is the city's SAF site, or it was up until recently. Um, wanted to let you know that we have discontinued use of that site as our, as our uh, SAF site, and um, <clears throat> staff has been working with um, uh, discharging our effluent to the uh, Palo Verde um, Water Reclamation Facility. We'll be coming back to you next month with a formal uh, decommissioning uh, proposal that you'll need to approve as part of the uh, process. And then um, Malcolm Perney, our consultant, is currently investigating the Bullard Wash to see about uh, possibly using that as a uh, lateral recharge facility in place of our SAT site. So we're still looking at options where we can uh, discharge the, uh, the effluent to the benefit of the city. This is a timeline uh, of the project. Uh, it's been basically the city's vision for quite some time, and that of the mayor and council, to have a city center. And uh, back in the 80s, the site was identified that we're currently working on. Back in June of 04, the um, city center specific area plan was kicked off and a comprehensive charrette process was, uh, was started in October. Uh, that was attended by hundreds of citizens who gave their input over the course of several days. Uh, we then formed the City Center Technical Advisory Committee that was co-chaired by Council Member Lord. Well, not at the time, you weren't Council Member, but... Um, and, uh, co Citizen Lord. Yes, yeah, Citizen Lord. <laughs> and uh, co-chaired with Jamie Cavalier. And that included a very broad uh, city citizen participation. That lasted two years up until uh, September of two years ago, almost two years ago now, where that plan was approved by the council. Uh, then starting last year up through uh, recently, the city has been working with a consultant on developing a master plan based on that specific area plan. And then earlier this year, we initiated an RFQ and RFP process for a public-private partnership that was recommended by staff and council approved that. And the Langford team was selected as the most qualified, best suited team for the project. And since that time, we have been in negotiations with them. Just for information's sake, you may wonder what are the benefits or why do we want to pursue a public-private partnership. 
there's several advantages on both sides of the table that, uh, that make a P3 very appealing. From the city's perspective, there's a potential cost savings when you partner with a private entity. Um, you can have uh, expedited project delivery when working with a private party. And uh, you can maximize limited uh, financial resources as, uh, as we would uh, be in the, in the middle of. You also share the risk where uh, if we pursued this on our own, we fully would, uh, would bear the burden of all the risk of the project. When you partner with a private entity, it's a, a shared, shared venture. You have ex access to their resources and their expertise, which are not necessarily available to the city, uh, city itself. And then finally, there's an opportunity advantage where if we didn't partner with a private entity, we wouldn't necessarily have the, the opportunities that, uh, that we can gain through this public-private partnership. Now, there have to be advantages to the private entity as well, otherwise this is pretty much a one-sided deal. And so on their end, they can receive a return on their investment. They're going to bring money to the table, but they expect to gain something out of it. They're also sharing in the risk where um, they're not fully bearing the, the brunt of, of the risk for such a project. They will have access to our resources that they wouldn't necessarily have uh, available to them if they uh, pursued something like this independently. And then finally, there is also an opportunity to them that, uh, that they, will, they will realize by partnering with the city as opposed to trying to do something independently. So that pretty much is the history of, of what got us up to here and why we're pursuing a P3 uh, to begin with. Next, I'll bring Brian back up, who will start talking about the agreements and some of the details that he's allowed to discuss. Thank you, Jim. On the agreements themselves, there's a, there are quite a few people involved in two different agreements. One is development agreement. The other is what we call a lease option agreement. That's a takedown of property by the private developer. Uh, just real quickly, not to go through all the names, those involved that are in the audience in the city center project, raise your hands, whether you're on the negotiation team or on the uh, internal team. So you'll notice that there are quite a few involved, and uh, we're, we're using them uh, a lot. We're also using Mr. Dave Scholl, who's retired uh, vice uh, senior vice president with Westcore to help us out on the private side to help us understand those things. and. His words tonight, if uh, he wasn't able to be here, said things are progressing very well. He, he thinks that uh, the negotiations are going extremely well, and uh, he may be here with us next time if, if at all possible. The agreements, the development agreement, a couple of things. One is uh, we will be in front of you on September the 8th in an executive session we're proposing to really get into what the, the business points are. And, and those are things where we'll have an opportunity to share those in a lot more detail. Again, can't do that tonight. Assuming that we go forward, we're looking at the agreement coming before council on September 22nd. That'd be both the development agreement and also the lease option agreement. Um, you'll notice that on the slide it says that the lease option governs more on the private side of things. Making sure that they perform, uh, uh, making sure that takedowns of property are done, that construction gets done. So we won't get a lag in building what we think is going to, going to be a vibrant um, city center. Project approach, as Jim talked about, we did a national search. We um, uh, finalized a, a team to uh, try and complete negotiations with. That's the Goodyear Civic Center's development, LLC. They'll introduce themselves in, the here in a few minutes. But we're also looking at, as we're working with them, what's, what's always been the consistent vision of the city center, job creation, tax revenues, vibrant downtown. All those things we're keeping in our mind as we're going forward. And certainly I think that we're very much on the same page with the development team at this point. The um, scope and development milestones, part of the development agreement, some of the things you'll see in there when the agreement comes back before you. So we'll have development management responsibilities, construction management, how do we phase infrastructure, when, does, when do vertical improvements um, happen, when do they have to be completed. Uh, we'll be talking about program design construction. Phase one is City Hall Library, their first office retail proposed, and obviously that's infrastructure as well. We will address future phases of both public and private that are coming back before you. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to jump right in, please. 
We'll have performance um, and, and prohibited uses in these agreements as well. What are the requirements? What are they required to do? What are we required to do? Uh, remedies, and those are very consistent with normal agreements, but the remedies, um, if in fact they don't perform, we have an opportunity to take back the property or perhaps even some of the development if it's, if it's not completed. So you'll see some of those uh, listed in the agreements as well. And finally, prohibited uses. If you think back, remember back to the retail liner space we did over at the ballpark, very much the same approach. We're going to have in there that um, things that will not be allowed for city center development, like tattoo parlors and um, pawn shops, thrift stores, check cashing stores, those types of things. We want to make sure that this, uh, for in perpetuity, keeps the vision that we have um, for the city center. The lease option agreement, that's the one where they have an opportunity to rent land for us for a long period of time. They are going to be doing what we call development rights buy-in. They'll be uh, paying us uh, cash that will be able to, to uh, that will be used for this project. Uh, that will be included in the agreement. Um, so it's how do we how do we work through that? How much money? How does it work? What's creditable? Those types of things. Um, lease and sublease terms. How long they're going to be uh, leasing these properties, and and what are the terms of those? And we will bring those before you on September the eighth as well. Finally, lease rate methodology. We've been a lot, of, a lot of work on that, a lot of studies. C.B. Richard Ellis has recently completed, well, actually it was 2006, uh, did a study for the State Land Department. Uh, we've done a lot of research. Our team has on how best to approach this, and we feel like we've uh, uh, reached that as well, market value and, and what we're going to do with CPI <laughs> inflation adjusters on lease property. So with that, we'll jump into the... Money man, Mr. Uh, Larry Lane, Finance Director. Thank you, Brian. Good evening. That is the nicest thing that I've been described in these discussions. Most of it's been wet blanket, so I, I feel like I'm improving at this point in time. Um, I'm not going to go over a whole lot new. The schedule that I have up here, the project funding and funding sources, represents the capital improvement plan as it exists today for this project over the next five years. Uh, this was reviewed with you. This has not changed since we reviewed it with you in the advance in um, um, April. So it's the, the, the numbers really haven't changed since then. You'll notice that we're using a number of different resources to, to fund this project and that it takes place over a five-year period of time. So whereas the total is $67 million, uh, the biggest chunk of that comes in in some GO bonds that would be used for the buildings during fiscal year 2009-2010. If you notice the note at the bottom down there, uh, I put a disclaimer in that says funding for a specific year may not be available until the latter part of the year. Specifically, the funding for the GO bonds would be available probably about March 2010. If we were going to build a schedule for this project to complete the buildings based on this schedule and all of the other infrastructure needed for the buildings based on this schedule, you can see how far out it would be before the funds would be available to build the building as it is currently being discussed um, with, with the development team. So a couple of basic assumptions that we talked about. One is, what are the impacts of future changes in assessed valuation? We talked about that at a considerable, um, more, or in, more in depth at the advance. And uh, we have subsequently met with the county assessor. And based on our, our uh, meeting with the county assessor, assessor, excuse me, we believe that the estimates that we made at that point in time are still uh, reasonable by uh, today's market standards as we move forward. In fact, the 2009-2010 assessed valuation may be a little higher than what we estimated, but 2010-2011, we have to assume maybe the market will not recover as quick as we assumed before. Um, water and sewer uh, rates to fully cover the debt service was talked about at the advance in a two-year phase-in period. That committee is meeting now. And the impact fee assumptions, I wanted to 
have my staff take another look and make sure that they were following consistently with what we had assumed in the project and we found that current trends are still leaving us um, or leaving us right there in the marketplace. So the discussion that we've had to focus a lot of time on is interim financing alternatives. If you look at the schedule that in the capital improvement plan for the full $67 million, it'll be March of 2013 before some of that cash is available, which creates a very interesting timetable of how you would phase in to build to achieve your, your um, objectives. And so for the timing of the project to get accelerated, uh, we've been talking about interim financing. As part of their proposal, the developer did propose interim financing through the Industrial Development Authority. We've looked closely at that aspect of the proposal. We've also looked at city-sponsored interim financing that would be asset-based. Different from the conversation that we had in April, if um, when speaking to our financial advisor just a couple of weeks ago, very specifically on this issue, when it is linked to a financing schedule such as I showed you a couple of slides ago, he felt that that would not have an adverse impact on our credit rating. Uh, that kind of surprised me a little bit, but that's a very important factor as we're moving forward, and so we're looking very closely at that. Of course, if we do interim financing on the project, we would have to pay interest and issuance costs on the interim financing, but it would create considerably more flexibility in being able to adapt the plan um, as we're moving forward and as the variables over the next five years change. With that, I would like to ask Rob Langford uh, to come up and start develop or discussing the project. Hi, I'm Rob Langford, uh, Mayor and Council. We're uh, glad to be here again before you and I want to thank uh, your professional team, your staff. They're doing a great job working with us and we very much appreciate that. Introduce my partners, Eric Judson, who you know, uh, JMI Sports, Eric Wilson, the President of Phelps Development, Mary Pampu, Executive Vice President of my company, Langford & Associates, and the Project Executive for this project, and Gordon Carrier, the uh, Principal and President of Carrier Johnson, the Architect. What you've gotten before you is the Phase 1 uh, uh, work effort <coughs> that Larry talks about, the $67 million budget uh, uh, will produce. Uh, it, will, it will build, uh, fully develop a 110,000-foot city hall building that you can see in the middle of the uh, screen, uh, 70,000 feet of which would be finished uh, with interiors and the balance for expansion. 30,000-square-foot library uh, moved across the, uh, the uh, inner road, if you will, to the north side. And the, the infrastructure that you see in green uh, includes the development of an Arroyo concept, which was developed uh, as we've gone through the master plan, uh, which will kind of start on the left-hand side of the inner road and work up, uh, uh, work up to the top of the library and then across uh, to Estrella. And the, 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 uh, the improvements that you're seeing there will be uh, uh, park-like improvements uh, on, the, on, the, on the back side or the west side of the inner road, as well as, of course, the park improvements that you can see on the, the inner side of the circle, which will really be the front yard to the, to the city hall. Uh, and that's uh, eventually, we'll, so, we'll show you in a moment the, the balance of the development, but we feel confident that the scope of the work we're talking about for phase one uh, the infrastructure, the city hall, and the and the library uh, will not only be an extremely powerful statement, uh, but uh, can be, uh, and we're confident, can be built, uh, developed for the $67 million budget that uh, Larry talked about. We next go to the slide. Let's see if I can do this. Well, I'm sorry. Let's back up. The, the, the next iteration of phase one, I wanted to show you this slide because it, it shows you where we intend to build our first private development, office development, uh, on the south side of the project. Uh, the yellow uh, represents about 120,000 square foot office and retail project uh, and some additional uh, uh, parking uh, to, the, uh, to the west of that. So that would be uh, the phase one as it would look like once the public facilities and our first private office development are complete. That's office? Right. Office space? Yes, sir. 
so, and retail at the ground floor. See if I can make it. There we go. Now, and what kind of retail? It's it's going to be, uh, you know, support retail to the to the activities of the office and your city hall and, and our and our office uh, for our office tenants, and we, we're going to be doing. Um, uh, the, quite a bit of study as to exactly the kinds of uh, you know restaurants and services that we want in that, but it, it's the kind of stuff there that will uh, provide the, the, initially provide and in the long run provide uh, you know uh, activity there for seven days a week kind of activity as well as support the office tenants in city hall as well as our own development. We're not we don't have a firm market study on exactly what kind of retail, but it'll be energy generating retail that will support our facilities and your facility. The site plan you're now looking at is the fully developed concept that we're working on. As you can see, we intend to develop a, another office building at the uh, corner uh, in Australia. The, the block north of the inner road is the uh, the third phase or the third office project that we're intending to develop uh, next to the library. Uh, the, the right above the library is the intended performing arts center and to the left of that is the uh, multi-generation building which will be again developed in a phase appropriate to the balance of the public and private phases. And then our residential thinking would be on the kind of the west side uh, the next two blocks uh, uh, that you see uh, that, that kind of surround the park. And you can see now that the, with full development of the site, the significant amount of additional park that we develop uh, uh, that, that, that it kind of engages with the multi-gen multi building, the library, the performing arts center, and the residential development that we anticipate on the west side. The final development piece is along Yuma at the lower left-hand corner. We anticipate that to be additional residential, although it could be office. And uh, the, the flexibility there is it's just a function of the, of the market. And again, with uh, most of these developments, the ground floor will be additional retail, such that you end up with you know, a, a total retail of about 37,000 square feet. Office anticipated to be 670,000 square feet, approximately, residential 465,000. And that's a uh, you know, that's that's the long term development plan. Is it residential? You said. Where am I see it? Mm -hmm. uh, it's four hundred and sixty five thousand. I got it. Is shown on this plan. And that, that's where. I uh, wish I had a pointer, but it, it, it's on the left hand side of the. Uh, the horizontal box or the vertical? It's the yellow. Box? Both. The, both the vertical box and the horizontal box. Oh, both of those. Wrapping, okay. kind of, pr providing the edge to the. Gotcha. To the uh, to the park, and and very and very possibly along uh, Yuma at the lower left hand corner. Matter of fact, the, the assumption is in the in the square footage that we're talking about that that is residential. You know, Larry mentioned that the bonding would be accomplished in probably March of ten. Saw the bond, and and this chart. And I assume the bonding would be construction of the city hall to start with. This chart so shows that we would occupy our city hall in July of 10. We have a schedule up here in a minute. Yeah, um, but that's the discussion that we had on interim financing, looking at uh, interim financing and then taking down with bonds as we go along later in there. And we'll provide details as we get more in there. But we would do interim uh, certificate participation financing or IDA financing up until the time the bond money is available. Yes, yeah, so that's it. So then this date is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Barry, you want to come up and let's chat about the schedule. Unless you had further questions about the plan, we can always go back to it. But Yeah, one quick question because sure. on the, the previous slide, you were showing just the library and city hall? Right. And then the next next slide you're showing, so so the library is closest to city hall, it's not closest to the universities? 
it's closer to City Hall than it is the university. Why, why are we doing that? Might have my 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 architect planner Gordon comment on that, but but we we feel like that it's still it's centrally located. It, it's a part of it's kind of sitting right on the park on and close to both parks really and close to the city hall, uh, and you know the the distance even though it's initially we had it in that where that horizontal yellow right. box was right yeah we got it closer to the universities but not right at right not right all the way at the top. Have the university the seen this? Yeah, they've seen it. Yeah, they actually suggested. Yeah, I don't see the problem with a university student. No. Walking or biking to the library. We you have this close for the citizens who may be coming to the city hall and the shops around. Right. Um, I think they're young and able to, that, uh, that. <laughs> to to commute to that area. No, that wasn't that wasn't the, the previous um, pictures that we'd seen. It was multi gen and library closer to the the universities, and I was under the impression, and I guess I'm wrong, that that the uni one of the universities wanted the library closer to them. And so that's why I asked the question. But, but maybe that's changed. So. Well, I think the alternative plan actually moved the... Yeah. Board and board. Um, I, just um, maybe to clarify, where it was, it was originally actually, if you look at the two curved buildings up in the upper northwest corner, it would have been the yellow built right there where Rob is pointing at it or that's somebody's right. pointing at it. I'm not who's sure who's pointing at it. Um, one of the reasons, if we can go back one slide, and I'm not sure how to do that here. I apologize. If the universities are okay, that's fine. I just thought they weren't. And so um, well, actually, that. the interesting part of, of the discussion, it wasn't really motivated strictly by the universities. I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it go backwards. Left arrow. I'm, Left arrow. Which way do I go here? I'm sorry. It wasn't really motivated specifically by the universities. They had said, gee, if we could be close to... The university would be great. Part of it was in this plan, and, and, and it's interesting, if you look at this plan, one of the things we thought is if that library, that, that orange piece, were shifted up to the curved corner on the northwest quadrant, it would be in an absolute, in, under a first phase development, it would be an absolutely isolated use under the other synergy of the other uses. So that's one of the reasons we thought it imperative to try to move it back if possible. The other thing we thought was interesting about it, it did get it it did get it close to the university, and I think their issue of close is, is relative thus far, and we'll find that out, certainly. But the other thing it did is that it put the library on the Arroyo as something that could gain north light and interact with a future performing arts center, which we thought also could be a, a wonderful synergy of uses. So those were a couple of the reasons. All of that is, uh, is up for discussion. So, sorry, Rob. I was under the same impression that the universities wanted it closer for earlier partnerships. I was, I, I was too. I hadn't heard. I, I haven't heard from them now. You say you may have talked to them since the last time we were here. Yeah. But my last discussions, specifically with UIW, were that they were very much looking forward to having the library very close to them. I, I know it's relative. I mean. Five acres versus ten acres is close. close. It's still yeah. pretty close, but I'd want to check back with our partners and see and whether this, see what their remarks are on this before we were to. Yeah, we, we definitely need at least two of those schools to come in with a, with their opinion on this. And uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. On my entire. Yeah. And I, I agree with that that they need to be checked with. However, I kind of like the idea of the library. I don't. I would not like it to be just totally associated by the citizens with the universities. It's their library and, you know, the citizens' library. And I think that you reiterate that by not putting it right so close to the universities. Right. So, and again, you know, it's not, a, it's not a bad walk coming across that oh, beautiful it'd park. Oh, be beautiful. No. These guys are... Well, guys the integration are of just having people going back and forth, right. getting people... Yeah. Plus, the, the library's got a, a retail piece to it, too, which, uh, which libraries do these days, which also helps invigorate that whole central area. Right. But, but, if by, but if by placing a library closer to the universities, we could make it a more robust library in terms of potentially partnering with those universities, I would encourage our council and the rest of the staff and the folks that are working on it to explore those opportunities. I mean, you're, you're talking about four-year, six-year, eight-year, 12-year postgraduate institutions that have dollars to put into R&D and, therefore, books and 
library-like activities, we ought to be discussing that with them. And if we're not discussing that with them, we're doing ourselves a disservice as well as the universities a disservice as well as our citizens. I don't disagree. You know, libraries aren't like they used to be when we went to university well, libraries. I know they, they, they changed a lot between. No, <laughs> no, dis, no disrespect. <laughs> they no, but changed, I mean, no, but no. I, I, the they've libraries changed. have changed a lot. I know. And they're no, not know, like it, they were when you and I were using I, university libraries. I, I don't disagree. I'm not saying it's just it's just a, a book. <laughs> I'm, Wait I'm, a minute. We need to. No. I'm not. I'm I not saying that. But, this off and but I know this that there's been strong, no, there's been strong in. interest yeah. from the universities, and every time I've talked to them about the city center, libraries come up in the conversation. It sounds. Well, like we could discuss this all night, really. and I guess they our the recommendation is go to the universities, uh, talk to them, they get their feedback, and get back to us. Accreditation. They have to have us accreditation. Yeah. Okay. I think we all made good points. Let's move on. Well, again, we have engaged with it. Brian or Gordon got a lot of experience working with libraries, and, and he'll continue to, uh, to do that. Let's see here if I can get this thing going. Just so there. Mary, do you want to speak to the uh, schedule? Okay. In front of you, you have a conceptual project schedule. The timeline as we see this going forward. The mayor stole my thunder earlier by saying that July July 2010 date is what we have for completion. As Brian indicated, we hope to be back on September 22nd with documents. Once we have the approval of those documents, we will move forward quickly with design and also with the zoning approvals that we have left. As you can see, our planned area development permit, we hope to have that processing begin at the end of September of this year. We'll follow that with our site development permit. Lastly, we'll have our civil engineering permit, which will obviously allow us to start grading. We hope to have that in April of next year. We'll have a 15-month uh, 15 construction schedule, which obviously allows for city occupancy, hopefully, at the end of July in 2010. And then, as you can see, we anticipate our private development will also start shortly after that. That would be the office building. And I guess at this point, I'll turn it over to Gordon to go, go over to some design approaches. Thank you, Mary. Um, The, uh, the, the the next logical step for us is to to move forward in the design process, and we wanted to talk a little bit about what that might mean because sometimes it's a little confusing. First of all, I would say it's from our point of view, it's almost by definition an iterative process. We don't know what you know, and a lot like the discussion we just had about the libraries, we want to learn from you and understand what's important not only to you but to the constituents that relate to the to the universities as well. So that's a, a big part of our interaction with you. So it's client interactive. Um, part of it is to make sure we understand from you the direct understanding of who the client is uh, at, at, and, and to make sure that we're acquiescing to the needs that that, that client def definition brings us. So that will be a big part of it. Um, the city center and the library both um, need to go through some processes that are characterized here under program verification, meaning we need to really understand the baseline of what is needed for the library and to make sure we're clear about what is needed for City Hall itself. And I've just made some notes here that talk about uh, uh, the, the steps that might be involved with that. We're going to test the spatial needs, meaning we're going we're to look at everything and make sure that you're clear about what you need and, and make sure we give our experience to that to say we might be able to find efficiencies here or there in the process. We're going to confirm departmental relationships, who relates to who in what way. This is both for the library and for, for the City Hall project. I will say that we have looked at test plans for libraries, and we understand, in fact, I have a couple of them with me today, we understand the general under, uh, layout of the 30,000-foot library, plus or minus, that, that, that has been given to us. And we've got a lot of experience with libraries, so we're pretty familiar with that program. Uh, we're going to verify the square footage quantities that we've been told are needed against benchmark uh, like places in other parts of the country. Um, we do a lot of city hall work as well, so we're blessed to have some benchmarking we can use there. And then um, ultimately we're going to reconcile all those things with a real budget to make sure that what people are saying they need uh, is what the budget can provide and be honest about where we are and we think that we're in good shape, uh, as Mr. Langford had talked about a little while ago. Um, we're going to then confirm a site strategy, which really gets to what you just talked about. We're going to come back and say, do we have everything in the right place? Uh, they are, are they arranged correctly? 
Um, and uh, then we're also going to verify private sector placement, that the private sector buildings are where they need to be uh, in each of the phases going forward. Uh, ultimately, we actually start the design process for the buildings themselves, because right to that, to date, that will have gotten us all the information that allows us to, to uh, consummate a design, but then we'll actually start designing the city uh, hall or city center and the library at that point. Um, and really, there are two issues there that are, are of vast importance. We're going to follow the program, obviously. That's an underlying agreement. But we're going to find functional acuities, meaning function is going to drive the way we look at things so that efficiencies make this, these, these uh, projects, both the library and city hall, work well. And then we're going to deal with the notion of imaging. What does it look like? Uh, what's the symbol of Goodyear, and and what is comfortable to you as an as a symbol of Goodyear, so that as we move forward, and the projects are completed, they meet your aesthetic criteria as well as your functional criteria. So that's um, uh, at least the, the snapshot of how we would see ourselves moving forward. All of that's done within a, a, the notion of materials aligning with uh, with the image, meaning that they they have the right ap appropriate appearance, that they're durable. Uh, and that they're budget sensitive in the process. So that's uh, our process. Thank you. Councilmember yes. Lord. Yeah, I have I have somewhat of a concern, and I had talked to the staff, and I'd also talked to city manager on this. Is that some of the ga uh, architectural gateway overlay that has happened from the south of I-10? Um, I've made comments about some of that, that some displeasure of some of the looks of some of the places. So my concern has been all along is that we needed an architectural overlay for the four corner quadrant that steps it up a little higher than what we had from south of I-10. And so I've, I've made this known to staff and to you. And where in that process, if we decided to do that, does that happen in order to make it uh, prudent to the timing? That also says we have three other quadrants there which worry me sometimes of what architectural look they're going to come out with. If they can use the minimum of what we're using under the gateway overlay, I say it's not high enough. I say that we want something better than what we have there. So I throw that out to you today because that is going to take some time for staff, and I would, I would love to hear how the other council members feel about that. Good point. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Fred, yeah, I definitely Fred, think I, we have to keep in mind that uh, we're, we're a city of 57,000 people right now. And if we're building this city hall that's going to take into consideration a population of 360,000, it appears to me that in the, the construction area that we're talking about right now, there's, there's got to be room to expand these facilities as population grows and, uh, and we get an impact to that population in the city center area. So I think you've got to keep in mind that if you've got a building today, okay, you've got to make sure that we have room to expand and have enough property to do it in for the future. Well, I understand the point. And I, maybe I forgot to, I did forget to comment that the, um, the, the plan you now see up there is the fully developed plan, which is a 225,000 square foot city hall. That's a big city. Starting with 110 initially, but this builds it to the 2017, is that right, Mary? The, so, so we have laid the site plan out and done our thinking and phasing uh, and strategies such that uh, we will accomplish that up to the uh, HDR program. I think it was HDR that programmed uh, 225,000 square feet approximately for the uh, full build out. So, so that is taken into account. And, and because, plan. You know, you, you yeah. can't build with the idea that you're going to tear down and rebuild again. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to have to something there that we can add to right. rather than, than disrupt or, or, or uh, tear it down. Right. So let that. me let me just so say see, I, see how we're adding. Let me get. I want to get to Councilmember Lord's view. I want to get yeah, everybody's opinion separate. on that. Thank you. Uh, let me. You're almost finished, I think. Yeah. I've, Why don't you finish up? Yeah, and I then just we'll, wanted to. We'll respond. Thank the council, and again, uh, uh, the, the team that you're talking to tonight. Uh, we've done a, a lot of projects together. It's a very exciting project for us, and we've got a lot of experience at, uh, 
that we bring to the table, and we're this is exactly down our alley. We've got public facilities that we've built for many public agencies as well as private. So thank you, and we'll be here I just think it would help. I think uh, the layperson looking at this, I think Councilman Sousa's question was admirable to say that because in our eyes, it's hard for us to picture that. I know from the specific area plan, I know that that's what we're going to be doing, um, but normally looking at this very difficult so maybe future briefings you could maybe articulate that a little bit better so that that we would understand the space that you're going to develop and what the space is going to look like for later i don't know how you do that but well you're the expert does that do you see now how we would do that that we we have the site that we just, yeah the site plan phase one site plan Yep. Allows for See that other line the addition there. of just about another 110. Matter of fact, a little bit more than 110,000 square feet to the to the left of the initial city hall building, uh, which we built. Coming back one. down the south of that. Well, it's around the curve. Well, the curve. Yeah. It looks yeah. like it's part. Yeah. Throughout the curve. Before we go around, Harvey, I think yeah, Harvey, uh, reference Councilmember Lord's point. I want us to talk about this over increasing the level of quality in the overlay is what it sounds like. Uh, it, does the current overlay, how far south does that go? Mayor, Council, it, it goes from uh, McDowell Road to Goodyear Boulevard on the, the north side, the north. Uh, so it doesn't get into this, the, the real focal point of the city center. It goes north, of, stops north of it. That's correct. So vis-a-vis so, so vis -vis your comment, we're talking possibly about a, another overlay. Let me clarify that. It also goes south of the um, south of the loop, uh, on the south side of the loop, down um, down Australia Parkway. And the purpose in the um, it's the north loop or the south loop. It it goes to the it, it excludes the it excludes the city center area. Right. Um, the uh, purpose in the gateway overlay district was to um, have consistent um, landscape design, street furniture, and a look down Australia Parkway. And also, it extended out about, I believe, 500 or 600 feet onto private property to have a, a, a consistent look. It didn't address architecture. And in the specific area plan that was adopted by council um, 2006, uh, it, it provided for contemporary uh, southwestern architecture. It provided for primary colors and secondary colors, and it gave the kind of quality that we want in the city center and just general parameters. But it didn't, it wasn't to the level of specificity that will guarantee that we'll get, you know, consistent look and design. And then through the PAD process, this particular property must get a um, zoning approval, and that's when we will um, nail down exactly what kind of um, quality and the architecture we want and what we want to require on the other three corners. Yeah, because it worries me. Just Sun, Sun MP alone, if they want to develop that down by the stadium, well, they could develop, and that building can look exactly like the buildings look up closer on Estrella, exactly like that. And they could, they could rightfully so. And they, and they, you know, and if we don't put some kind of standard. Um, when they come before us, then you can't blame them for saying, hey, guys, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. We need to, we didn't, I just think we need to step it up so that I don't, how, Harvey, you're the expert on this. You know, you have to tell us how we do that, what kind of materials we need to state, um, and, and, and architectural lines and so forth, because I don't want us to develop a really great looking city hall and then the other three quadrants do the minimum because that's all we've told them they have to do, right? So a city center overlay. A city center overlay so that when we drive down that city and we cross that street, we don't see anything else in the city like it. That it's okay, something Mayor, really can I add special. something to that? Let me, let me just, before we do that, I'm gonna, you're going to get a chance to do that, <laughs> okay? Yeah. But we're also running out of time here. Oh, Why don't we go around, we'll start over here on the right, give your perspective on what you heard, and then respond also to Councilmember Lord's input. If we could do that, we'll start with Councilmember Holland, and then we'll go to you, Frank. Okay, um, I, Harvey. I don't know. This is you're standing up there, but I don't know. If this is particularly oh, I can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> You're just kind of stuck here right now. Um, but I, I made my comments about the library, so I I won't. I, I think this is looking good. I think we're on the right track. Um, 
the I like Council Member Lord's comments. I guess I thought that was kind of being done, that coordination was being done. So it's interesting to find out that perhaps it's not being done. So I, I kind of agree with her, and I really don't, I'm anxious to kind of see where staff will come back to us on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember yeah. Cavalier? Yeah, and I guess I have a lot to say on that, but it's, it's mostly, we've got other things that we have to tie that into. That city center has to tie into the ballpark um, retail area because they are uh, the the quadrant southeast quadrant that you were referring to, uh, Council Member Lord. Uh, also ties right into that uh, commercial area that is adjacent to the ballpark. So that's all part of that, and I think we've got to, got, we've all got to work together on that. And then, and then as long with as long as we're talking about this style and something that's a step above and I really uh, am concerned about that as you mentioned that Georgia the, the point being what I saw as a design that was first brought to us was mostly steel and glass becoming archaic uh, you look around the world and, and in mo a lot of places the newer designs are going back to more traditional and of course the mayor made the remark he would like something more Romanesque uh, that last meeting. Uh, the fact <laughs> is people want and people are leaning toward the more traditional and they they feel more comfortable with that. And especially in the southwest a lot of glass and steel all over the world a lot of glass and steel doesn't cut it. I mean that uh, look at the Louvre. Parisians hate the the pyramid yeah. in front of the Louvre. Look at Berlin the Reich, the Reichstag Berliners hate the right stuff because they put that glass dome on top of it. And and this is happening not just in this country, everywhere. They're, the glass and steel is, is uh, you know, there's got to be something else. And I think it has to be a step above. has to be something better then so that people come to it and say, wow, you know, this is really great. So I agree with you on that, and, and we've got to be careful how we approach that. The other thing, I don't want to dwell on that, but the, the library, square footage of that library is dependent on requirements for accreditation on these universities. Uh, is 30,000 square feet enough to, for the accreditation uh, requirements for universities? Something, that's something we have to look at. And then um, the other thing is, is if any of this is turned into restaurants, does anyone know the distance from the high school? Uh, Oh, I'm sure you've looked into that. There's that 300 feet. If there's a restaurant that serves alcohol. We got to be careful that it's not too close to the high school. So that is something that didn't even hit me until t tonight. So, so just a point that I thought mm -hmm. that we thought of. We better be thinking it. And that's all I have. Thank you, Vice Mayor. That last point's a very valid point. I had. I don't think any of us had thought of it. Thought I just now thought of it. Actually, a city center. Um, Specific comments on the on the site plan. I'm still a bit concerned about that opening to the north. I talked about that the last time y'all were here. Um, I, I I know I've harped on the university uh, stuff quite a bit, but uh, want to make sure that you know while it, while they're separate and delineated campuses between ours and the universities and the universities and ours, it still would be nice to be able to walk between the two without feeling that disconnect. Concern that that narrowing up to the north is still not fostering that. It's hard to tell on paper, though, and not the scale. Um, are we? Are you getting stuck up there? It's probably not a good thing for you. But uh, so I know this may or may not be your question. But are we still considering an underground pass through there on the north to the universities? Is that still part of the equation? From a design standpoint, uh, the, the question is: is under underground? Well, or you know, at grade, but you, go, uh, you know what I'm saying. Pedestrian, so partially subgrade, grade separation, crossing. Thank you. Yeah, over the top of the roadway um, on that north loop. Uh, right now, like it's not contemplated in phase one. They did theirs. That's what I was kind of envisioning there. 
Pardon me? If you've been to the Biltmore since they changed that crossing there between right. the Ritz mm -hmm. and the Biltmore, it's kind of, that's I gave them pictures, kind of what I, I envisioned I went, there. Pictures I'm wondering if that. we're still keeping that in the plan. Um, at phase one, it's not anticipated because of cost considerations. Um, can that be looked at in the future? It's certainly we, it's something we can take a look at. And then the, fi the financing that you showed us earlier in the slide, are we taking into consideration the dips that we're seeing and the ability to pay that back? Is that part of your cost schedule? I'm getting a, yeah, but that's, I mean, you're considering the trends that we've seen? Actually, that the assessed valuation assumed a 20% drop for 2009 in residential with only a 5% pickup in growth, so a drop in residential value of 20%. That netted to a 15% drop. Preliminary numbers we've received from the county says that 2009-10 will be about 10% drop. So we're coming in better than the estimates that we did at that point in time. Correct. But we did contemplate drop in assessed value. <coughs> the economy, yes. I don't know. The county assessors have been out looking at homes, so <laughs> they, we may get it. There's increase. probably going to be another drop, I think, is the expectation well, for what would be the 2010 assessed valuation, which will actually be kind of the value as of January 1st, 2009. And, and then a quick answer to Council Member Lord's question. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for looking at the architectural standards. I think we're going to have to get creative because if we start talking overlays, we start talking Prop 207 issues. I have a feeling our attorney would guide us on that in the future, but just given the discussions I heard last week at the at the League of Cities and Towns conferences, a lot of our colleagues are shying away from it because they don't want to be the test case of the Prop 207 law that was put into effect. Um, so if there's a workaround, I, let's let's do it. We ought to set the example in that four corners, by all means. And we ought to hold everybody around us up to that standard if we can legally do it. Mayor, I just want a real quick comment just to follow up with what the Vice Mayor said. In terms of the architecture, um, when we approved Sun and P's zoning on their three corners, their documents pretty much mirrored what we had in the specific area plan, and they, our development will precede theirs, and whatever we come up with and we decide, we set the, the standard and the level of quality that we want in our, in, our, in our corner, and we will require that of the other three corners because their standards are um, uh, conceptually enough that we can conform. They'll make them conform. So I think we're in good shape right now. We just need to get what we want as a community. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Osborne. Guess where I was this summer? I was at the City Hall of Philadelphia. <laughs> and that was pretty incredible. But I know we're not going there. <laughs> um, I will have to thoroughly, thoroughly agree my, my P and Z background, I, I'm telling you, we need that overlay. I totally respect your thoughts on the 207 because that was flashing through my mind. Um, as for, uh, but I don't think it would hurt to even look at the gateway overlay itself. Maybe that needs to be stepped up a notch. Um, and having some kind of design guidelines, I think that's what we're speaking of. And so I, I totally agree, and I've already said, I have to say about the library. I think we just need to have that discussion. Oh, and you know what? The word that I thought of last time, nobility. That's what people think of, as, as Frank was saying. People go back to um, the days of uh, when you enter an area that's supposed to be um, stately or where decisions are made. You expect a certain feeling when you arrive there. And, and nobility and and that type of essence of what it needs to be. I don't know how much we get for $67 million, but that's what it has to be. Council Member Lord? Uh, just on, because I've made enough comments tonight, but just on the architecture, I think you can do glass and steel and other materials and make it stately and make it noble. Um, I just think that we're looking for a different look than that we've been seeing. And I don't know what that is. Wow, that's up to you. Councilmember Souza. Well, I just want to make sure that uh, we take keep in mind the expansion potential. Yes, uh, we don't run out of space for the future, and uh, that we plan wisely now uh, to face uh, a situation where we have to reconstruct buildings and they're not building to 
to get larger construction. So plan it and give us enough space to do it uh, for the future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I would just add one new comment, and that is that I, I hope we're really planning on smart use of water in this area, not just from the conservation standpoint, but from the amenity standpoint, the water feature standpoint also. I, I think that the staff in Lankford and Associates heard some pretty good comments over the last few minutes from this council, and uh, it sounds like we've come together on quite a few areas, broadly speaking. So I, I would hope that those are seriously considered and uh, we move forward with those thoughts in mind. Okay, this uh, meeting will be adjourned. Why don't we uh, go for 610, is that all right? 610, we'll start the council meeting. Thank you very much.